Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 10th annual Bronislav Geremek Lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished guest today, Mrs. Anita van den Ende, Director General for European Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Good afternoon, madam. Mr. Konrad Szymański, Minister for European Affairs of the Republic of Poland. Good afternoon. Dr. Wojciech Federczyk, Director of Lech Kaczyński National School of Public Administration, which is kindly hosting this event today. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Piotr Arak, Director of the Polish Economic Institute, who will deliver a lecture titled The Balance of the Costs and Benefits of European Integration for the World After the Pandemic. Good afternoon. My name is Agnieszka Wicewicz Price. I'm head of behavioral economics at the Polish Economic Institute, and I will have the pleasure of moderating the discussion later on. I would now like to ask Dr. Federczyk to take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to Lech Kaczyński National School of Public Administration. It is the second time we have a pleasure to host Professor Geremek lecture. I would like to emphasize that this is the Jubilee 10th edition of this event. I warmly welcome distinguished guests from the Kingdom of Netherlands and also Mr. Konrad Szymański, Minister of European Affairs of Poland. Of course, uh, I also welcome today's speaker, Director Piotr Arak from Polish Economic Institute. Due to the pandemic, the number of participants presence of this event in the auditorium is limited, but I would like to welcome everyone who follows the broadcast online. Today's lectures is related to the most important contemporary challenges. The COVID-19 pandemic is a real black swan. Therefore, it worth considering the impact of the pandemic on the process of European integration, which is crucial on our continent. A symbolic question can be asked is, Quo vadis Europe in new era? We will hear answers focused on the economic dimensions in today's lecture and discussion after the speech. And now I would like to ask Minister Konrad Szymański to take the floor. Madam Director uh, Anita, uh, Mr. Director of the School, Mr. Director of the Institute, uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to have a chance to share with you some uh, welcoming uh, remarks. In fact, it will be one remark because I will have a chance to comment a lecture um, after uh, the uh, delivery. Um, I think it's, uh, it's great that we can continue the uh, novel tradition. I think 10th uh, edition justifies such a word. 10th edition of the Professor Brunsov Geremek uh, lecture, together with the yearly consultations, Polish-Dutch consultations on foreign affairs, it constitutes our regular basis for consultation. There are a couple of reasons, good reasons, to consult with Netherlands. I think, uh, especially after Brexit, we have a lot of common interests. We have a lot of things where we should find a better, even better understanding, of course, but but what is most important is the fact that we, we have a lot of common uh, concerns and common, common interests. 
And uh, after our morning session, where we can spend some time uh, with uh, Director General uh, talking about uh, present issues, the most urgent issues of the European Union, I can assure you that uh, Netherlands uh, is probably the best partner to talk about costs and definitely best partner to talk about benefits. So I think it is a very wise decision to choose exactly this issue, a very present, very urgent issue of the way we want to finance EU and the way we want to spend money as a, uh, EU. So I believe that uh, this is uh, the right format uh, to discuss this uh, a very hot uh, question almost solved, I would say, uh, question, but uh, this question will stay with us for, for much longer. I think it's, uh, it's, it's great uh, to have our Dutch uh, colleague uh, here, and you will see why I believe so after the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we go to your interesting lecture, I would like to say a few words to all of you. And then we have the discussion on cost and benefits uh, after the lecture. And I'm really looking forward to what you have to tell us about it. Um, for me, it's an honor to be here and uh, also very special that I could come. Uh, it was already mentioned, we live in very um, special times. Uh, I saw already at the sheet after the pandemic, uh, and I think we will maybe still in 10 years speak about the world before and after the pandemic. Uh, so I'm really, really glad I can make it here. Uh, in this specific 10 year, we have this Jeremic lecture. Um, and I want to say a few things about history before we have a discussion uh, about the future and the topics uh, which are on the table in the coming years. Uh, but I think Poland, uh, it's a special country and I'm in this job now for exactly one year. Uh, and I think it has been a very special year. Uh, we celebrated 100 years of diplomatic relations with Poland. Uh, but also what made a deep impression uh, on myself uh, was that we also celebrated this year 75 years of freedom. Uh, and your president, Excellency Duda, he visits uh, our king and queen in the Netherlands uh, and then he went to Breda to celebrate the liberation of Breda and we know we couldn't have done that without help from Poland. So I think we have a long history uh, and I know our king and queen were here as well uh, to commemorate uh, the liberation of uh, Auschwitz. Uh, so I think we have a strong, strong history uh, and I think that's a good basis to work closely together in the future as well. Uh, and I think the world has changed dramatically over the last six months. Um, and I think it's really good and I'm really glad about the consultations we had this morning that we always keep looking uh, what binds us together, uh, what are important topics, topics we can work together on uh, to make this world uh, also for our children, grandchildren to make it a safe and a good place to live. Um, so I think this today, um, it's really important that we have this lecture, that we have this relationship, even in this uh, very difficult times for everyone. Um, and I hope that uh, we can have a good lecture, a nice discussion, uh, and I'm really looking forward to all the bilaterals we will have later on. And um, uh, yeah, I wish you all a good afternoon and I'm really looking forward to all the discussions and the exchange of views. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for the chance to speak with you. I'm just gonna change the scenery for a moment so okay it's present um so 
The European Union is always under threat, we could say. Each new crisis means that we could, the community must reinvent itself. It must think of new solutions and sometimes reach for ones that were discussed many times before, but not we didn't have the strength, for example, to introduce them. Uh, this is the case of the recession introduced by the uh, COVID-19 in 2020 and the economic prospects of many countries uh, and the whole European project itself. Uh, probably we're in a big crisis as we were in 1929. This is what the economic data says and which I'm going to show. This brought about a very big political change throughout Europe. We remember that thanks to this crisis, the Nazis got to power in Germany. Um, because of the mishandling of the economic fallout. Economics changed. Many countries dropped the gold standard in the 1930s because of this crisis. Um, no one knows what the current crisis is going to bring, but it's for sure going to be a big change. Currently, we live in the 20s of the 21st century. Not many people you know, think about that, that we live currently in a very different century. Uh, a historian in the future decades probably is going to think of the name for this period of time um, because probably one era ended, might be a new era starting right now. The golden years of the end of history that we saw through the uh, last 30 years probably might have ended. Uh, so I think to look into the future, we first have to look a bit to the past so we can select the options that we want to change in our path or not. Uh, for this reason, I will consider the process of European integration for over the years, along what happened in the last, uh, last periods of, in the last period of time, and also what might happen in the near future where pro we could have an enlargement, for example, with North Macedonia and Montenegro. The EU managed to create prosperity and chances for development for many of its inhabitants. This is one of the reasons why so many people decided to go over the Mediterranean to cross the, the sea, to live in a different world. Um, in search of a better life, what we call the European dream. A Dutch economist, Jan Tinberger, the first laureate of the Economics Prize in Economics, was one of the creators of modern times econometrics. Um, he also helped to create inflation targets for central banks. He was a very important person in the economic sphere and monetary policy. But he also had much to say about international development. This is not part of his, uh, not part of his uh, official work, but maybe one of his more opinions, opinions that he uh, um, publicized throughout Europe. Tim Perhe was officially and at the beginning hostile to the European project. Uh, he was uh, a consultant for the League of Nations before the Second World War. No one can blame him that he thought that many international organizations might not work uh, correctly. He, uh, at the, after the war, uh, he was more of a globalist. He thought about creating a global order, creating a global government, and he saw a, a possibility in that with the United Nations and the creation of the international organization, which had also the members from the south of uh, the global of the global sphere, and also uh, those from the north. Uh, however, when he saw how the process actually was going through in the United Nations, he began began to cheer the process of European integration, something that is a step ahead for something that he dreamed about. Um, he started to suggest that some level of integration between the global and the national level might be useful and perhaps even necessary. Uh, this is directly linked to one of his theories, academic theories on the uh, optimal level of decision making, uh, a process that uh, um, uh, he rethought the role of Europe in the global economy. Thunberghe argued that in the post-war economies, it was Europe, not the USSR or the US, that um, what the, had the optimum economy, uh, uh, both in the social econo and the economic sphere. This would become one of the hallmarks of his theory of convergence, of something that we use today in cohesion policy, as I use for it uh, 
in the years that we passed and the, for the future as we uh, um, uh, foresee it. Europe, thanks to that, is a lifestyle superpower. We live in the longest, we live the longest, we work the shortest, uh, we're happy. Most of the nations, also in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, in the last uh, Gallup uh, surveys, say that they are mostly happy. This is what changed with the European Brussels. The regional differences in you know, Europe are smaller than they are in China, smaller than they are in the US, and also in the sense the European Union is unique because we have this, um, uh, this process that help us go here. But as I said before, European Union might be, uh, might be under threat because of the economic crisis, but also of the sluggish growth uh, in the years to come. Um, today, we potentially live in an age of new secular stagnation. What does that mean? Uh, the existence of demand barriers, a slowdown in economic growth, a growing gap between potential and actual GDP growth. Uh, this sounds a lot like a description of the current crisis, but actually this th thesis and hypothesis was introduced just before the Second World War in 1938 when we saw a slowdown of all uh, economies in the world. Uh, or after 2008, we also could see it as an as a element of the effects of the financial crisis. In 2014, it, 2013, the former US presidential, presidential economic advisor, Larry Summers, started discussing the new secular stagnation hepatitis, which states that market forces are insufficient to bring the economy to its full employment growth uh, due to permanently negative rates, uh, and sh as shown with the Japanese experience since the 1990s, the poor performance of US and also of Europe after the 2008 uh, financial crisis. This is somewhat in line with the degrowth uh, um, theories that are somewhere in the, uh, out there, talking about uh, slowing down the growth rate or also uh, even having the chances of a recession. Uh, a recession that we are living right now, which not, might not be a great idea uh, to bring prosperity. Um, since the big, last big enlargement, we saw that there has been a big shift in those countries that generated growth. And I mean the Central and Eastern European countries. This is what I want to show. Um, for each country, we had the convergence, we had the Kachinak process, which took place through the single market, the huge consumer base that we saw, uh, the influence of investment, but also the policy of equal opportunities on the single market. This can be seen in the increase in GDP since the country joined the EU, but also in the average salary, the duration of the exposure to those factors, so investments and also the um, um, uh, uh, the investments, but also the single market and the trade that it that created. Um, it, it created a lot of growth in Lithuania, Romania, and Poland, where we saw the GDP per capita grow by more than 60% from 2004. Uh, in Italy, in Greece, it actually dropped in this period of time, thanks to the, not thanks, but due to the process of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the crises, both that we are, uh, those countries faced. While many countries which are, were developed in that period of time, it also had an increase. In Netherlands, for example, it was 17% through that period of time. So the EU is mainly a convergence machine thanks to the single market. There are many arguments in favor of EU membership. This is one of the topics of this, of this, of this lecture. But there are some external effects that have a cost. We always have to remember of that. For each country, as I'm going to argue, the, the costs outweigh the benefits, uh, even if some countries make, in my opinion, the wrong decision to leave, like the UK. The benefits of EU integration are multidimensional, cultural, economic, political. But it's not only uh, the EU integration is not only limited to the single market. It consists overall of, um, of the benefits of the single market, of progress in legal institutions, increase uh, the freedom and choice of consumers and producers, and also the freedom of businesses to roam around Europe. Uh, it also is crucial for achieving the comparable, comparable living standards across Europe. 
Many EU countries were not worried, uh, and I remember this discussion in 2004 in Poland and before, uh, about EU membership. This was one of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, it was a political decision. Uh, we, we, uh, many countries decided to join, uh, not because of uh, 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 economic will, but also as a political decision com connected with security. And uh, later in the process, we also uh, saw that there is a uh, there is a division, a highly, I think, a very wrong division between takers and givers, which is also seen in many uh, political discussions across the Atlantic, um, which is, in my perspective, somewhat wrong. Taking into account the financial effects of EU membership, member states are often divided in those two groups. But as for example, Henry Ford, when he uh, decided to give uh, higher income, higher wages to his employees, he knew that this also creates additional trade, uh, additional uh, consumption, which is a macroeconomic effect. The economic impact of the 2004 enlargement provided the whole EU with significant amount of additional uh, money and additional value created for the economies uh, in the whole uh, European Union. And we see at this chart that for uh, uh, Luxembourg, Austria, Belgium, Germany, and Denmark, uh, thanks to uh, consumption and tax revenue, this was uh, more than 6,000 euros per capita in each one of those countries. And even for Portugal, it was just 50, uh, but it's still See, we see that the balance of, of, uh, of the process of the old 15 was positive. Um, and even if we take into account the transfers uh, that were done through the cohesion policy and through additional factors and also which we, uh, 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 we pay, we can see that uh, uh, the balance is for most countries positive. Uh, uh, this is taking into account the, the whole balance. So we see that Luxembourg is the least benefiting uh, economy. Greece, Belgium through this time was the least. But if we, we connect this with the economic uh, benefits of the enlargement, of the single market, of the cooperation and trade, uh, each country has a positive balance. Each euro spent by EU 15 countries in these terms um, creates additional uh, revenue for its economy and for its uh, uh, tax system. The largest ones in Germany, uh, in the UK, in Austria, and for the Netherlands it was approximately more than, than six euro of economic value for each euro spent through this time. But th there are some additional costs. We discussed them very much uh, in Polish media for a long time. This was the, uh, 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 the, the immigration that happened in a lot of those CE countries. And in some of them, uh, the outflow of people uh, to Western economies after 2004 amounted for more than 10% of the population. This was the case of Romania. Uh, for average, uh, in our group of countries, this was about 5% of the inhabitants that we had. In Poland, it was approximately 4% according to Eurostat data. And at the same time, se uh, Western countries saw an increase in the size of their population. So those people went somewhere. And um, uh, in Austria, 3%, and in Ireland, in Spain, and Italy, uh, around 2%. In the UK, 1.5% of the inhabitants, those are quite big countries, uh, are coming from Central and Eastern uh, countries uh, uh, and from this, uh, from, this, uh, from this block. This was one of the, the costs. Another one that I'm, uh, and our institution is uh, quite famous for, I hope, uh, is uh, saying about uh, the problems of profit shifting and uh, on, from East to West, but also uh, around Europe and around the globe. Uh, this was another problem uh, for uh, our economies. Uh, the money sent to Central Europe uh, by Western countries, why the budget pales a bit in comparison uh, with the profits that Western companies make from investments in dates. 
there's nothing, nothing wrong with making a profit. I'm, you know, I worked in business and I, I, I know that this is the proper way to do it, but as long as you pay the taxes that you owe in a country. The single market has a drawback of, um, uh, of a process of uh, uh, profit shifting, as was discussed by Thomas uh, Tursloff, Ludwig Dier, and Gabriel Zugman in The Missing Profit of Nations. Uh, each country loses parts of its corporate income tax, sometimes more than 10%. Uh, this is almost the case of Poland. During the process of 2004 to now, we lost about 9 billion euros of uh, uh, corporate income tax revenue. Uh, uh, Czechia lost almost 5 billion, Hungary almost 4 billion euros, uh, Slovakia 2 and Slovenia around 800 million. Uh, there are also those who profit as Malta and Cyprus, which we also have to remember as we see at this balance sheet over here where in those countries almost 80% of corporate income tax revenue is created through uh, transfers from those uh, from other EU members. Currently, as I said at the beginning, we're in a crisis, a very big one. The economic, the ongoing pandemic could be seen as a global natural disaster. The first effects were of supply nature. We had the broken chains of value creation. Companies disappeared from the market. Um, people often couldn't perform their jobs because they couldn't work. We still have masks on today. Uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a reason for that. This is the, the difference between the current crisis and the financial one from 2008. The latter was of demand nature with, rather than supply. Exports and investments fell first, which only led then to, uh, to layoffs. We had, or we could have saw layoffs at the beginning. The effects of natural disasters depend on the duration and the same probably is going to be with the pandemic. Uh, there are as earthquakes, for example, uh, where we sometimes, if it's a short period of time, we see a V, so uh, or um, uh, a sign that uh, we can we can have a uh, rebound anytime soon. With long-term disasters such as droughts, floods, uh, locust attacks, for example, the GDP uh, drop is quite is quite high, and it doesn't take uh, that short to go back in the period of growth. This is a L-shaped recovery, which we all fear. And um, if we look what happened in 1929 and what we see in the projections for 2020, then we know that probably uh, we're going to have a, a, a longer process of rebound and the drop in the global economy uh, is going to be taking us back in time about six years when in 1929 it was just one year which is, uh, for me, as an economist, as a person looking at data, uh, quite uh, scary. Um, but we see a chance in the upcoming time. So we see a possibility of rebound uh, with the data from the, uh, coming from the, from the market, uh, coming from different statistical institutions, also from the European Commission. Uh, the summer projections for the Eurozone uh, were that the economy is going to contract by about 9% and grow by 6%. The EU economy overall is going to have a drop, a recession of more than 8% and to grow by 6%. Currently in Poland, we expect that the, that the recession is going to be shallower than the European uh, Commission projected in the summer and probably is going to be around three and a half, 3.2, actually with our own projections of the Polish Economic Institute. What do we can, what do we can argue to do in the process of, uh, of, um, of uh, fighting with the pandemic? Margaret Draghi, the former head of the ECB, um, argues that we need to invest our way out of the recession. Uh, he said that debt levels will be high for a long time. This is also what many finance ministers across Europe say today. But we only sustainable if we use good debt for productive purposes uh, rather than bad debt for unproductive purposes. Currently, we use a lot of public aid in order to fight with the pandemic, fight with the natural disaster. Uh, as percentage of GDP, Poland, for example, introduced uh, 
the aid to the economy of almost 12% to GDP, uh, which was one of the, the highest in, in, um, uh, in the European Union and similar to the, those of advanced economies. And um, the scare is, uh, as I said, that we don't manage to grow in the, the years to come uh, because we have a very low investment rate. This is what Europe lags behind in comparison to the US, uh, Korea, uh, and other advanced economies. Uh, in China, the gross formation of capital, which is an economic euphemism for investment rate, um, it's 43% to GDP in the period of time just before the pandemic in 2015 to 2019. In India, it's 31%. In Australia, it's 25%. In Canada, 23%. European Union, it's 21%. It's not, uh, uh, it's not comparable or it's not uh, um, uh, good if also a slowing down economy as the US has a similar number. Um, this is a very big uh, issue and that's, that's why I'm, uh, and this is also my private opinion, I say that the MFF and also the budget for the recovery fund is just about right. It's not uh, uh, of perfect size, uh, but it's just about for us to have a, a period of growth through the years to come. In July 2020, the leaders of the EU, uh, Minister Szymański and Director General uh, here, uh, managed to, to, uh, to have a deal on the financial framework for 2021-27, and also for the recovery fund. This is 1.8 trillion euros to be spent, um, the lar largest recipients of this fund uh, are going to be funds, funds are going to be Italy, Spain, and also Poland and France. However, it, in terms of the intensity of as assistance, so also per capita, uh, which we uh, always count uh, as economists, it's uh, Greece, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and Croatia are going to have the largest amounts of money per capita receiving for this, uh, for this time. And for me, uh, seen here, uh, for me, what was uh, important through these negotiations is that each country has a list of reforms to perform. Each country has a negative balance sheet actually with the European Commission. Uh, we don't, Germany, Netherlands, Poland too, we don't need to um, make South suffer. Uh, just to reform through the process of going out of a, of a very, very big crisis. Uh, in Poland, for example, um, uh, during the crisis, uh, uh, we saw the issue of very flexible forms of employment for artists and freelancers, which is used. Uh, appreciated by the employers, not so much by many employees, uh, but it don't, those uh, work, those uh, working contracts don't um, are not don't provide the full social protection for those employees. But the government and we and uh, we too, as advisors to the in this process, we decided not to educate people about economics and what when to do social protection um, and that they should have cho chosen a better form of employment in order to have a, a reserve, uh, have received state aid, for example, or be apply for state benefits. Instead, there was a tailored special allowance for those categories of workers. During a crisis, helping people, in my opinion, is key, so that no one is left alone. This is what, for me, the Polish solidarity meant 40 years ago. And I would say that a lot of European countries would benefit if we thought more about us in those terms. Uh, coming almost to an end, uh, I would say that we do not learn to expect the things that are not expected. Uh, in 2020, for example, the global business community uh, in Davos Forum um, expected extreme weather, climate action failure, natural disasters, loss of biodiversity, and human-caused uh, environmental disasters. Uh, throughout time, after the crisis of 2008, we expected 
also economic uh, crises in 2008, 9, 11, uh, the problem of debt. Uh, we didn't see, uh, we saw uh, the pandemics always after. So in 2015, after the Ebola outbreak in 2009, when there was SARS, um, this wasn't on the table, although some pandemics were happening all around the world. Uh, as of 2011, climate, the green, the green bits in this chart here, was the most important thing that we saw as the global threat for Poland, for uh, European Union, and also for the United States. Um, these were the subjects of our interest. These were subjects that we were participate. We were uh, wanting to be um, ready for. Uh, we are increasingly seeing a risk of cyber attacks and technological malfunctions as one of those processes which we would uh, uh, would have a very big impact on us. The biggest of impacts that we saw, so we saw, so the business community saw was also climate action, weapons of mass destruction, and also a, a weather crisis. Uh, nowhere here we can see a pandemic that created uh, a recession that, seeks, uh, that uh, um, drove us back six years in the past of economic development. And this is why we need to think about the processes, uh, uh, what we do expect and what we don't. As, as the director here said about the black swans and also some processes and uh, risks that are uh, of great threat. In 2020, also those people expected that the biggest importance was the clash between global powers. We see that. Uh, political polarization, extreme heat waves, and a cyber attack of something as the top five reasons what would have an impact on the, on the state of the economy of the world. What we didn't uh, expect Uh, is a terrorist attack, attack, a state on state military conflict, a deep widespread of poverty, a currency crisis, which we actually kind, kind of saw with the process of the pandemic, even a market collapse of stock and other assets. And this was the, the risks that were, you know, having the least probability for 2020 as happening. And we went kind of through three of them uh, through this year. And um, uh, since the financial meltdown of 2008, we had the SARS pandemic in 2009, a double dip of the economic crisis in 2011, the debt crisis of 2012, the Russian aggression in Ukraine in 2014, and Brexit in 2016. This is, this is a long list which doesn't take into account the terrorist attacks, wars that are still being uh, fought around the world, and uh, if we are to survive as the fragile European Union, which is always in crisis, because there's always a crisis happening around somewhere, we must be solidary so that the membership still st stays policy, so, so the membership and the balance of membership still s is positive. As Jan Tinberger believed, European integration makes sense as the Dutch proverb, and I don't, I'm not, I'm going to use the English version of it because I cannot say it properly. Uh, we need to be able to tie even the devil to a pillow, which in, is, as, as I read about it, which means that the persistence overcomes everything. So even if we have such great risks, those risks which we didn't put on the tables, we need to be persistent in analyzing the risks and adapting to those realities, as we did in 2020. We must remember our objective of creating a fair and solidary Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start the discussion, I wanted to briefly go back to uh, your introduction, Mr. van den Ende. Uh, I would like to stress something that wasn't said yet here today, uh, namely the Netherlands is also a very special country to us, which is why we're here, and I think this is something that most, if not all Poles, would 
testify to. I certainly can testify to it myself, having spent a number of years in the Netherlands, living there, studying there, also under supervision of Tim Perha's student in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, it is a very special country, and I do hope that Poles, the Polish community who are there now and will be still coming there, will also benefit from your great values and, and, and virtues. But together, we're also facing a big challenge, and there is no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic has been a great test. We could say a reality test for the European project. The Greek meaning of the word crisis, krisis, is the turning point or the decisive point. A challenge, but also an opportunity. Is the European Union ready to face this challenge? Confess the weaknesses the crisis exposed and work through the crisis as an opportunity to regain its institutional strength? And I will address this question to Minister van den Ende first. Does it work? Yeah, let me first start by thanking you for your very interesting lecture. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, and that may, um, I'm now working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where, but I'm an economist in background and work, having worked for the Ministry of Economic, and, uh, Economic Affairs and uh, the Treasury, it was really interesting. It, feels, it felt a little bit like being back where uh, I've worked before. Uh, and I heard you say something about this is a, su a supply crisis. I think it's a supply and a demand crisis, but we will not go into that for now. But it's really interesting what you wrote and what you said. Um, yes, are, am I optimistic that Europe can handle this crisis? Um, I think what happened in July uh, in Brussels um, gives reason to be optimistic uh, because we came from very different positions. Uh, we had tough negotiations, we were there for five days, but we managed. And we did something we've never done before in Europe. We managed to have an agreement on a uh, recovery fund. Um, and we did things we've never done before. We have allowed that there be grants from this recovery fund going to other countries. Um, we have conclusions on the rule of law, we have conclusions on procedures. So, uh, yes, I'm optimistic in a way that we have shown common ground, that we uh, see that we need to help each other to work together. Um, are we there yet? No, we're still in the middle of the crisis. Um, we have some very important uh, topics on the table in the coming months, like migration, like, like climate. But I think that at least we have set this first and very important step that makes me hopeful for the future. Um, yeah, let's keep up the good work and working together as we did in the last couple of months. Thank you. Mr. Szymanski, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I think we can start this debate with such a fundamental question, if, if we succeed or not. I, I, would, I would definitely uh, agree with uh, Anita's opinion that we have a success because it is an unprecedented situation where we could find, uh, maybe with some delay, but anyway, we could find a way how to form a, a relevant European uh, response to the economic, at least economic aspects of the crisis. And this the response is not only about the direct economic effects of the crisis, then we would address only the needs of the most affected countries or sectors. We did something more. We invested with the Resilience and Recovery Fund. We are to invest also for our resilience in the future, because this uh, pandemic, uh, I'm afraid, isn't the last problem we can expect in the future. I hope uh, not nearest future, but uh, we have to think about our future this way. And uh, Poland, since the beginning, even before Germany and France, uh, tried to uh, promote this way of thinking the use, unprecedented use of borrowing capacity 
of the European Union, tremendous capacity of the European Union, uh, and uh, in forming uh, an instrument which would uh, be an, an urgent response to the crisis, but also resilience building instrument for uh, for the future. So it is it is something. Um, it is it is important. I hope the implementation and the, the whole delivery will be on time. Uh, it's not only about the union's capacity, but also national administration's capacity. We used to uh, use instruments, well-known instruments, especially here in Poland, of agriculture policies, of uh, structural funds, etc. Now we have a plenty of new instruments, and we have to learn very, very fast uh, the way we can use the new instruments. There is no model for this. But in general, I think we, uh, we delivered something important. We, in May, um, before the, the whole negotiations uh, started, I mean direct negotiations, we also stressed the importance of the scale. Because uh, as we saw in one of those graphs, uh, the highly integrated fiscal capacity of the United States uh, can't deliver uh, such, a, such a successful convergence uh, and growth in their own country. Our budget, uh, so controversial uh, in some countries, is very, very small. Uh, if we compare it with the needs, if we compare it with the cumulative GDP, it's, it's very small. Uh, we, uh, in May, we stressed the importance of the scale because uh, this uh, crisis and economic consequences of this crisis is, uh, uh, is unprecedented. And we can't um, deliver any significant response with small money. It's, it's simply impossible. If you really, need, if you really want to, to answer uh, to the crisis like this, we need uh, more money. And it happened. Uh, of course, the process was very shaky, very, very tough. I understand the, 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 the reasons, but I think one of the lessons we have to learn from this experience, of the experience of the negotiations before and in July, is new narrative about cost and benefits of the Union. Uh, I, I'm reading European press with growing concern, in many, many press, including Poland, to be honest, at the moment, it's not a hot issue, but one day it will be a hot issue. Uh, in European press, you can easily find uh, numbers about costs, because it's easy to, to find a line in the national budget or contribution to the EU budget. It's very simple. Uh, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a budgetary problem, because this cost is nothing comparing with the benefits we all have, including countries which would uh, uh, find a reason to feel uh, um, most um, contributory to the uh, to the budget. Uh, I think we have to find a new narrative, and we have to deliver the message to, to our societies that contribution to the EU budget is uh, nothing important, comparing with the benefits we can get thanks to the European integration. Otherwise, we are moving toward the blind alley. Uh, there is one country already there. Uh, where people can't understand why it is so good to be in this uh, mechanism of trade integration, which is a little bit costly, may, maybe a little bit expensive, but it can benefit a lot. And in the end, in this uh, budgetary dispute, budgetary negotiations, there are no losers. It's a win-win operation, and I'm afraid our public opinion isn't fully aware about this fact. Uh, we are, of course, in a quite different position because we are so-called net recipients, but it means nothing because one day, I hope, with the growth, with the development of our economy, we will face the same problems. I mean, uh, the problems of the political or public communication. You're slowly preempting my next question, which is about principles and narrative as well. Uh, history teaches us that in order to overcome a novel difficulty or a novel crisis that we haven't seen before, especially one that affects a number of actors, uh, and diverse actors like the European Union members, it is necessary that there is some agreed upon external principle or basis that we can build the future upon, common future. Uh, does the EU of today have such a broader principle? 
that it can sign up to together, uh, through which it could stabilize its precarious position, precarious situation of low growth, high debt, and bleak demographic prospects. If so, what is this principle? And if not a principle, maybe a common goal. Is there one? Okay, so if I'm the first one to answer this, uh, so I, I feel, think I highlighted one of those, uh, one, that one, one principle in the end of my speech, so it's solidarity. solidarity. Um, so uh, this is one of the, um, uh, the issues um, just before, it was also what Schumann talked about uh, in 1950 was also talking about new solidarity, actually, between two rival countries, France and Germany, uh, which were uh, fighting uh, just five years ago, one was occupying the other. And actually the two ministers and two governments uh, managed to form an alliance uh, in economic terms in order to, to um, increase the interdependence between the two economies and increase growth. And then we had the 50s, 60s, and 70s that said that the, that the secular stagnation uh, hypothesis um, from, the, from the 40s wasn't true uh, in Europe, actually. We saw that, uh, um, that this, uh, this growth uh, in the United States is quite sluggish. And uh, with the enlargement, but what we can do, what the US uh, actually can, is that uh, uh, it would have to buy additional countries as Donald Trump wanted to. So he wanted to buy, uh, uh, buy uh, parts of Greenland, I, I guess. This is just 50,000 uh, inhabitants. It's not a big market. But we, we can, we can uh, increase uh, the common market, actually with the enlargement policy, with the cooperation and economic cooperation. And actually, this is one of the, 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 um, the big forces uh, that creates value. We have more than... Uh, uh, approximately 500 million um, uh, consumers in, in Europe. Uh, this is a very big uh, and important issue. And if we have an enlargement policy in the years to come, and if we have those institutions in place, and also those redistributive of, um, uh, redistributive elements that will increase infrastructure, infrastructure meaning in the economic terms, not the uh, brick and mortar, but uh, different kinds of infrastructure, also uh, technological um, uh, in the years to come, then I guess um, uh, our chances are to be better off than the United States. And as, uh, as in the 60s or in the 70s, they would have a different kind of issues, also internal, which we won't see in the European Union uh, if we do this correctly with the welfare economics that we have, with the redistributive effects, with, which all of our nations have, and some as, uh, you know, that the uh, Netherlands has the best uh, healthcare system, in my opinion, in the European Union. Uh, and also, uh, it works in a very different way than it is in the United States, and that's why it works. Uh, and that's why a lot of, a lot of um, uh, European countries, uh, too, um, actually managed to uh, fight with the pandemic uh, on a very efficient scale. Uh, and this is what we have. So this is, this is something, the silver lining of the crisis showed that we have some elements that, that uh, create some of the future and possible crises manageable. Uh, and comparing us, for example, as, as European Union to China or to United States, I think like uh, if you're choosing a place to live, uh, and wanting to, you know, pursue a career and uh, I feel better off being here. And especially as, uh, as, um, as Europe has one of the, uh, one of the, um, uh, was the, has the convergence machine, but also has an economic growth engine, which is Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, for the last years, uh, this was the the, the 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 region that spurred growth to Western Europe, not the other way around. And in the years to come, with proper policies, proper business cooperation, this is actually what can manage to help us uh, to go through uh, through a period period of different crises. We saw that there are many different issues that could happen. Uh, probably uh, better off than the United States. Do the other discussants agree that strengthening of the common market should be the way forward and the 
the goal, the principle that we should pursue in order to overcome the crisis? Is that all? Is that enough? Um, I think uh, have, we had the discussion, or you mentioned, Minister, that how do you sell this to the public? And I think have we had, in a way, to sell uh, the agreement in Brussels in July to our parliament and to the public. And I think there were two lines uh, my prime minister took to explain why, in the end, he had agreed to this deal. And one line, and that's very close uh, to what you s just said, is that we, as the Netherlands, and people in the Netherlands, benefit from a strong European Union. So that was the reason, because if you, like three months ago, our parliament firmly said to my prime minister that they would never, ever accept grants going to countries. Uh, and I think one of the storylines when we said we need to do this because we benefit from the internal market as Netherlands, we agree upon that. And my minister said over and over again, when a country goes bankrupt, it won't buy our products, so we suffer from it. So that was in the end the way we said we need, we have to accept grants to make these internal markets stay there. We all benefit from it. Um, and I think also the other uh, argument you mentioned is the geopolitical one. We need a strong Europe. We are all countries and we only as a union, we are strong in this very difficult world. So I think both the internal market, but also from the geological point of view, um, we need a strong Europe. And I think that's for the Netherlands, but that's more in relation uh, to the way we look at the internal market. Uh, we once entered the Economic and Monetary Union. Um, the idea behind it was that we could have more convergence uh, and what we see that for some countries um, it's hard to catch up with economic growth and you showed it yourself. Uh, so that's why for the Netherlands it was very important that part of the deal uh, in Brussels were two elements. Uh, when we have grants we need countries to reform, really reform, that the next crisis they will be better off in a way. Um, so the reform part was very important. Uh, because that makes the internal market flourish also in future. And secondly, and that's more to your second question, uh, we need those common values. My Prime Minister once said if we erode on common values like the rule of law, we in the end will also erode on the common market or the internal market. So I think that are kind of values we need and we need to flourish. But I think all those elements are in the package we, we agreed upon in July, so let's implement it. and see how we can strengthen the internal market and also very much agree with you on the resilience that get, get out of this crisis in a green and resilient way to build for a better future. We'll come back to the question of values in a moment, but on internal market itself still. Um, I wonder about the feasibility of the common market being the way forward. And let me explain, if we are going to reform our states individually, in order to build national resilience. Is that not a threat to the common market? And is that not a threat to European solidarity, about which I'd like to talk a bit more later? Oh. Of course, uh, it could be a threat to, to the common market if you would leave the whole resilience package to the national states. Uh, because national states and uh, constituencies are legitimate and uh, people are expecting that in time of crisis they will do something. And to, no one uh, should be uh, surprised uh, that countries with uh, opportunities will deliver. For example, state aid. That was mentioned in, in this uh, um, perfect lecture. Uh, how does it work? So that's why we should do our best as a union to offer a relevant answer to the crisis, not to leave national states without any sort of coordinated measures, coordinated uh, uh, aid, not only in terms of uh, financial transfers, but also regulation. Otherwise, of course, the deterioration of the market is possible. And it would hit, in the, not longer, a medium perspective, it would hit our own growth. Because the tendencies to do it own way is everywhere. 
it is uh, rather unprecedented to have a common market like this uh, among 27 countries with such a deep trade integration, with such a, a enormous harmonization of norms which are so favorable uh, uh, to the individual persons and small and medium uh, sized enterprises. It is, of course, the only way to, to get this potential on board and use this potential, but of course this potential is bigger than we have today. We, did, we, 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 we don't use a full potential of the common market. And this is another story we, 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 we repeat. We are just uh, a week ahead of the Council, European Council dedicated to the single market and probably together we will repeat the same story. We need um, elimination of barriers, we need deepening of the market, we need to complete market where it is not completed. We have to confront the protectionist tendencies. I fully understand why people in stress uh, looking for a solutions which would be protectionist, but we have to confront it because it is, uh, it is wrong answer for the real problem, but definitely wrong answer in the longer term. The potential of the market is still huge, so we can do a lot. And one remark on values and, and market, I, um, I think as, at least in Polish narrative, we sometimes confront, uh, we sometimes create a false alternative, the values or economic efficiency, for example. I think the, I would prefer the more holistic approach because we as a human beings need everything. We need a common aspirations, we need more or less common imagination about our role in the society, the society we want, more or less inclusive. And at the same time, we need security, we need prosperity. We, we shouldn't divide, we shouldn't definitely confront those two things. Uh, values will flourish. For example, the, the inclusivity of our societies will flourish only if this society uh, will be successful in terms of economic efficiency. Nothing wrong with money. I don't not need to repeat it to my Dutch friends, but I think in Central Europe we should repeat it because we live still in the imagination of the time, very, very bad time of our past, uh, communist past, when we had only values to protect because we, have, we haven't any sort of, of, of opportunities to develop in material world. Uh, I think now we should uh, think about it twice because there is no such a dichotomy uh, between uh, economic, pragmatic efficiency and values. On this note, uh, and given that we are in the 40th anniversary of the beginning of Polish solidarity, I cannot not ask this question. Given Poland's experience and legacy of solidarity, uh, we are particularly eager to promote this particular value, solidarity, on the European level as a value that is central to the success of the European Union and its integration. Uh, we have seen, however, that agreement about values is often merely nominal in the European Union um, among the member states. Uh, what would you define as the core values of the European Union now in the, well, let's assume, post-crisis or the future of post-crisis Europe uh, of the next decade, say? Is it solidarity and how would we define it? Or is it something else that should accompany it as well? Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a dif difficult one uh, because I, I just named one and uh, you want me to name more. Uh, we can is, elaborate on this one too. Yeah, we can elaborate on this one. So um, I guess it's, you, you know, this is um, what the European Union managed to do is create a very uh, pragmatic economic policy, going back to uh, one of the, to, to, uh, the things I talked about. Uh, and um, uh, it's not that the European Union is social democratic or it's center left or I don't know, uh, Christian democratic. We created an economic policy which is very pragmatic. So we have elements of redistribution, we have elements of competitiveness and liberalization of the internal market. Um, this is a mix of different kinds of policy, sometimes protectionism for the, from, uh, for the single market, from the outside world, which is also uh, um, uh, coming from a different ideological stance. And 
from from this point of view, uh, I guess it's why it works. So uh, we tend to uh, create institutions that work well for uh, a very long period of time. And if we cannot think of something working better and agree about it, uh, we don't change it. So uh, this is something very interesting about European Union, uh, why it works basically for so many for so many years. Take into, for example, the VAT directive from the beginning of the 90s. It was introduced as a temporary measure that we would have to think of a different and new VAT system for about a couple of years. Then it stayed permanent. The European Commission wants to reform the VAT uh, system. Uh, each time it proposes new solutions, the member states say that the best that the, the previous one is better. Uh, it don't want to, they don't want to change it because it's going to distort the businesses uh, operating on the single market. Although the VAT system is so complex, and if someone here is a tax advisor, then he knows why he earns so much uh, through the single market. And also, this, 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 what, what Poland did in a couple of years ago is that they, we fought with fraud that is also possible thanks to the single market and uh, through the VAT uh, system as it is. But see, we, we, uh, we delivered a pragmatic solution temporary solution even, that works for 50 years. There are some bad externalities where we can fight with them, uh, but we also go slowly for new ones. And the same goes with uh, what the European Council decided on. So for European Union to have uh, its uh, sources of revenue in the upcoming years, which is also quite pragmatic because we know that some certain types of taxation is impossible to be introduced uh, on the state level. Uh, in the new global uh, economy, in the global sphere, uh, with different kinds of uh, transactions. And, uh, and uh, yesterday I was just on, in a debate on platform economies, so the uberization of workforces across the European Union. Uh, where does a company that provides services in 20 countries pay taxes? And then why does it pay uh, the, the um, where, where does it pay and why it doesn't pay actually taxes or it pays uh, the income taxes for their employees or how, what kind of contract distortions does it use? And this are, these are problems that uh, need cooperation, pragmatic solutions on the international level. Uh, we, uh, as a country, or the Central European, uh, Central Europe, or one France even, uh, cannot manage uh, to work on such uh, issues by itself. We need a global uh, cooperation. When uh, a threat from a CEO of a certain company from the uh, for the European Union that is going to stop providing services in the European Union if we introduce some new solutions and regulations is for me uh, the show of force of this uh, regulatory power that, uh, that Europe has um, to some uh, external um, or corporations or, or the external threats sometimes even. So, so I would pragmatism say pragmatism as a way towards pragmatism, so pragmatic, pragmatic economic policy. Pragmatism as a way towards solidarity perhaps. I guess with the Dutch we don't need to argue over pragmatism being an important value but is it a way towards solidarity? I think this is something that we will uh, see in the future. I would like to know, because we're running out of time slowly, I'd like to move uh, to the level of bilateral uh, relations. And um, it is the case that expectations are changing in Poland as more people living in West, uh, are living Western lifestyles here in Poland without needing to go to the West. Uh, and I wonder, are the Dutch also adopting to the fact that their supply of relatively inexpensive labor may decrease uh, in, with time and the Poland's role in the EU will increase, especially post-Brexit, uh, and with its increased prosperity given that Polish is still a country that is developing uh, relatively quickly compared to Western uh, Europe. Um, is the Netherlands ready for a post-UK EU? in which Central Europe is playing a larger role? I think there were a lot of questions in this <laughs> one last question. Um, is the Netherlands ready? Um, I think, to be very honest, we're still searching a little bit. 
And I think we're not the only country uh, because uh, the balance has shifted. Uh, a country very close to the Netherlands, it's, we can, in, in clear days, we can almost see it, uh, which we have been working together with for a long time. Uh, yeah, it disappeared from the, from the European Union. I think this summer showed that everyone is looking for new partners, new coalitions. Uh, who are my new friends? Uh, do we have more friends? What's the right balance? Um, I was lately, I heard someone say, Sometimes we have to prove Germany and France that they're not uh, going to be um, uh, the boss in the European Union all, on all issues. So I think a lot of countries are struggling. Uh, and as you said, we have a thriving Polish community in the Netherlands, but we see, we see change. In, and I think you see changes here as well, because what we see actually it's like uh, for the first years we had a lot of Polish people, but now you have more prosperity here. People go back home and we now have more people from Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, and I think maybe in a couple of years we have more people from the Ukraine. Uh, but but that's, that's, I think that's a different issue. Um, and I think also for Poland, you cannot do without seasonal workers. We can do without seasonal workers in the Netherlands as well. Um, but come to your more um, explicit question about bilaterals. Yes, we are always looking for good bilateral relationships. I think, as the minister mentioned, the internal market, the digitalization, uh, not because we're in a crisis, embrace protectionism. I think there are a lot of issues the Netherlands and Poland completely agree upon. I think there's economic issues about deepening and the completion of the internal market are really uh, ways forward. And I'm really looking for good cooperation on those issues, but also on other issues like climate change. We always have to see, okay, what do you need to make this change there? What do we need in the Netherlands? Uh, and I know we talked, you talked a little bit about solidarity. Um, I know that uh, in the Netherlands it's often said that, of course, solidarity is important, but solidarity gives the other person receiving the solidarity also a kind of responsibility to act well upon it. Uh, so we always say solidarity goes in a way hand in hand with responsibility when you get this solidarity. So. Thank you. I also have a question about Poland's future role in the European Union. At the last summit, at, at the recent summit, we saw that Poland can quite successfully defend its legitimate uh, rights and interests. Uh, is Poland ready to take on a more important role in the European affairs uh, as a major player rather than supporting actor? I think, uh, especially after Brexit, uh, we have to reconstruct the internal architecture of the Union, uh, not because of theoretical models, but because of the needs, the real needs. And of course, the needs we have together with Netherlands are obvious. We, at least we, afraid losing the right balance of interest, the right balance of regulatory approach to the new uh, challenges ahead of us. We afraid protectionism in internal market and externally. So uh, we have no choice. We, we, we have to think uh, about our future without Great uh, Britain. The, I think this is the basic role of, of politics, to create opportunities even out of the failures. Sometimes reverse, of course, we are good in this as well. But, but we have no choice. We have to find a way how to um, secure the, the right balance in the Union, to, how to secure the future of the Union uh, without such a great country. Because the Brexit is obviously uh, the negative thing. Whatever we think about chances, about the possibilities, opportunities, it's a very negative development. And uh, uh, the Union without Great Britain is the Union where the risk of bad decision making is higher. Maybe not dramatically higher, but a little bit higher. So we have to be careful about our own future. And Poland, of course, with its own agenda, um, I think is very transparent partner. It's, it's exactly well known what we believe it's worth doing as a union. It's exactly well known what we don't want to do as a union. Uh, and I think this uh, least could create uh, a new consensus 
in the Union, a new consensus based on right approach to climate, right approach to migration, right approach to, to, uh, to uh, cost and benefits as well. This is the source of our conversation. I think this is one of the most existential things because the narrative we have right now without any significant change means that we will lose another countries in, uh, in the European architecture and we don't want it because we believe union is, a, is an opportunity for us uh, and the scale of the union is important. Union isn't a burden. Uh, it's, so, so we want to do our best to, um, uh, to counteract such a negative uh, tendencies. We did it, of course, before Brexit with a whole package of uh, specific solutions uh, addressed to Great Britain without success. It's uh, another lesson to be learned how to do it. I think it was too late. I wouldn't call too little because it was very generous offer, to be honest, but also institutionally, but definitely too late. So we have to think now about possible negative uh, developments like this, similar to Brexit. Thank you. I would like to open the floor for questions in a moment, but before I do that, I wanted to ask if there are any other issues or topics mentioned during the presentation that you would like to address. Um, you mentioned the supply. Yeah, no, I will not go there. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there are any questions uh, in the audience, I would like to volunteers to stand up, come to the microphone that's available here, introduce yourself, and mention who you're addressing your question to. Okay. Hello? Okay, thank you. Dzień dobry Panie Dyrektorze, dzień dobry Panie Ministrze, Chudedach, Dyrektor General, thank you for your hate for now. I wanted to ask about the investment on the financial market, this is the question towards you, Mr. Director. Uh, you mentioned that you have this problem of uh, return on investment and it's, uh, I think it's not a new problem. Uh, we already had a problem with uh, capital capital in the EU beforehand. Do you believe that perhaps we could use the COVID pandemic and the environment which may lead to some substantial changes in the European Union architecture to, well, improve the amount of investments inside the European Union? Do we need, uh, for instance, more regulations or fewer, less regulations? Is there some way to make use of the situation not only to get back uh, our economies uh, on their feet, but also to improve uh, uh, their capacity for international trade and investment in that aspect. Thank you very much. Okay, it, it was for me, so um, that's a very difficult issue. So uh, we know that the, the, the investment rate in the European Union was lower than in other developing as, as China uh, economies throughout the years. So um, clearly this, this is an issue. We also see a disparity uh, between the European countries in terms of the investment rates to, cap to GDP. Um, uh, this is also, uh, this is also a, a problem. Many economists in Germany currently are calling for Germ the German government also to use this process of uh, development. As we know from Olaf Scholz, Germany is going to run a deficit for the next four years, uh, which is something unseen in German economics uh, for a while. So um, uh, the, the consensus among uh, in economists uh, is, I would say, to use uh, this period of time in order to have a, a higher growth rate in the coming years. And that's why I was so underlining the investment uh, because investments in, in the current economy it doesn't mean uh, brick and mortar uh, processes. It also means high tech. It means non-material, um, uh, non-material software, non-material robots, and automatization. This is what also many people don't get that the automatization of in the economy it's mainly software-wise. It's not based on building robots that are going to take away people's jobs. It's, it's sometimes many, uh, many different kind of um, uh, 
endeavors and non-material kinds of um, uh, uh, works. We, we, we have a difficulty in counting the value of those things, but the reason uh, the important, uh, uh, the important um, recommendation is that uh, when I was citing, for example, Mario Draghi, is to invest a way out of the crisis. Uh, Mario Draghi says that this crisis, and if you if you do the if you see the data, uh, you also agree that this crisis is like Second World War in terms of what it does to the many of the economies. Uh, we managed to um, uh, take the, the costs of the uh, of the crisis from the private to the public in terms of the increase in debt. Uh, so the households wouldn't wouldn't have to be in debt in this crisis because it would be more more costly and this process would take a hell lot of more time to recover than it when it's the public uh, debt. Uh, but it also means uh, um, uh, that the, the process of going back to the normal period of economic growth, growth as in 2019 is going to take a long time. It's not that we're going to have just a recovery in 2021. It's going to be a very long process of redevelopment. That's why, the, that's why I said that the EMFF is just about it. We need more. It's, it's, it's the, it's, it's, in terms of having a, an average growth rate higher, we, mean, we need more money. Uh, because if so many countries are in debt because of the crisis, uh, Poland, uh, the, the general government debt in terms of the European uh, Statistical Office uh, definition is going to reach a number uh, higher than 60%. Uh, the G German uh, economy is going to have a, a debt rate and the general um, uh, government of more than 80 percent. In order to drop down the debt levels, uh, we're going to need to um, have a very, very rapid recovery. And this means rapid growth. There are other ways to go down with the debt. Uh, with debt, uh, none of them uh, we would like uh, in, this, in this situation, but this is because this is taxation, war, uh, inflation, and um, uh, some other uh, means which are also not, not nice as, as cutting the spending uh, of some of the welfare policies or the public aid sometimes uh, to some sectors that we also enjoy in the European Union. Okay, let's cross our fingers then for the growth. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for one short question if there is anyone who would like to ask. No? Okay. Thank you so much to all the panelists for the nice discussion. Thank you for your presence. Thank you very much.